So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to this event, to this time together uh, with Francis Weller and myself. I'm very excited about our time today. I'm really excited to be with you, Francis. So thank you for taking the time uh, to join us and to share your wisdom. Um, so I've discovered Francis, uh, in fact, uh, last year. Somehow, I didn't know his, his writing before that, and I was going through a, a, a deep process of loss, uh, losing uh, my elders, my last grandparents, and then the pandemic, and then uh, going through a very uh, heavy grief. And uh, a friend of mine bought me the wide edge of sorrow and say, I think you should read that. <laughs> and so I started reading that book. And I have to say that after the first page, I knew I was going to uh, really dwell uh, into uh, those worlds and that wisdom. And so I'm really pleased to, to have uh, this time with, with Francis today. So uh, I'm sure many of you have heard about him and that's why you're here. Uh, but I just want to properly introduce Francis. So uh, Francis Weller is a psychotherapist, a writer, and a soul activist, is a master of synthesizing diverse streams of thoughts from psychology, anthropology, mythology, alchemy, indigenous cultures, and poetic traditions. So he's the author of the Wide Edge of Sorrow, Rituals of Renewal and the Sacred Work of Grief, The Threshold Between Loss and Revelation with Rashani Rea, and In the Absence of the Ordinary, Essays in a Time of Uncertainty. He has introduced the healing work of ritual to thousands of people, and he founded and directs Wisdom Bridge, an organization that offers educational programs that seek to integrate the wisdom from indigenous culture with the insights and knowledge gathered from Western poetic, psychological, and spiritual tradition. Thus, in short, his bio is much longer, so I invite you, if you want to read more about it, to go on francisweller.net and, uh, yeah, just explore what is there. So welcome, Francis. Welcome here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm glad you're doing what you do and for the invitation. So based on my personal experience, that's where I like to start. And, you know, my, the reflection in my life, you know, I realized that when I entered that space of grief, I realized a couple of things. The first one was it was very difficult to talk about it. Not that I could not always find the words, but I always found that what people will tell me didn't really support my process. I didn't feel very seen or I heard things almost like, you know, oh, it's going to be okay or you can get over it or, you know, there's also beautiful things in life. Don't forget about that. Things that really felt even heavier because I was not able to connect to those things. And the second things that came to me as that process was going on is that I realized that in our culture, there is no space for grieving. You know, even I remember when I was living in New York City, you see someone crying in the subway and people kind of turn their head and kind of feel a little bit discomfort. Where in traditional cultures and Native American cultures where I've spent a lot of time and the elders I work with, grief is really embraced and present. So I would love to open the conversation talking about that cultural trauma, I guess, you know, or discomfort around grief and where is that? Where, why it's there and how did we arrive there? <laughs> there is a long history of our uh, denigration of grief and our avoidance of the territory in part because of our adoption or our, our idealization of individualism. And that's a very heroic concept. I'm in it alone. I have to somehow survive alone. I have to overcome my obstacles alone. 
individualism in a sense is a prison cell. It, it, it deprives us of the privilege of being able to ask for what we need, particularly in times of vulnerability. And grief is an exceedingly vulnerable time. When we're pulled to our knees, when we can't take the next step, when, when something has completely undone us, but we're still expected to somehow master it, to rise above it, to not be affected by it. And so many of the things that were, were there's such a, uh, I would call a lack of courtesy around the territory of grief, mm -hmm. how to be with it because we fear it. And we fear it because we've been deprived what we need around it. In a sense, if I'm condemned to face my losses privately, there's no way I can do it. Those losses are too big for my own individual heart, my own individual soul experience to be able to digest those things. They, we have to remember that grief has always been a communal process. Throughout our long history as a species, grief has always been communal. And then very suddenly, very recently in our story, particularly in white Western culture, we have been forced to do this alone. You know, I often joke, you know, we even have to go to a private practice you know, to talk about my grief in a, in a closed room all by ourselves. And hopefully the therapist won't shame me, but, but we still, it's all private. We've privatized everything. And the other thing about whatever we privatize tends to begin to accumulate shame around it, as if this is somehow wrong. I'm not supposed to talk about this. I'm supposed to always show the strong face, the confident face, the capable face. But when grief hits us, as you know, as all of us listening know, when grief hits us, that's not where we're standing. We're not standing in a place of confidence, of strength. We've been brought into the shadowed lands of sorrow and, and uh, we fall apart in these places. We don't know what's happening to us. Gravity pulls us to the ground and we're lost. In a sense, we've left the daylit world and we've entered a parallel world, a shadowed world, which is very dark, um, not in a negative sense, but in the sense that it's not lit in the same way. I think that darkness is actually quite holy. As Oscar Wilde once said, you know, where there is sorrow, there is holy ground. So we're actually taken into a very sacred territory. And in traditional cultures, as you mentioned, there was a whole different etiquette and ritual ground because they knew the person who was escorted into that place was doing very sacred work not only for themselves, but when they walk that long walk of sorrow, they would return carrying something medicinal for the village. They would have gathered something uh, like a tincture to bring back to the village as a gift. And that's not what we do anymore. Even in, you know, when you have a major loss, you're given one week, maybe two weeks of bereavement leave, and then right back at it even though your psyche, your soul has, has left the building. We're still, we still demand performance as if that is the basic line that we have to do is keep performing, keep performing. We forget that there's medicine being made in that time in the shadows. And so we lose out as a culture on all that. That's a long answer to your question. <laughs> no, that's a beautiful answer. Um, you know, as you're speaking, I, you know, and it's been one of my feeling when I sit with grief is that, and you talk about shadow, the shadow world, and, you know, and also, I guess, death, you know, that is there. Um, it's really our discomfort with this aspect of self in many ways. Like, we're also highly uncomfortable with death. It's also kind of privatized, you know, it's not something that that is right there that we have access that is, you know, on display in many ways. It is hidden. Even the pandemic, you know, we read numbers like alpha million death, but it's just a number. If we were to see all those bodies in one field, we would probably have a very different experience. Yeah. So 
Joanna Macy, she talks a lot about that in her, you know, work that reconnect and her process uh, to really awaken our souls. And, and the first step is the grieving process in, in her work. And I, you know, I worked with her and, and I really enjoyed it. And what came to me during that work and when reading your word is that I feel that when that is repressed, one of the main thing that comes is anger like unprocessed grief very often lead to anger. And when I witness the world, there's so much anger, uh, you know, political dis discourse and, you know, many things that polarized us. So I want to ask you about, about that specific relationship between anger and grief and how one maybe protect the others, how they are maybe a way for us to see that maybe beyond a certain behavior, there is something that is not grief there there was not sorrow that were expressed and how, and how do we do we go about that there are multiple layers to that question so let me just start by saying um, grief is not just tears grief is also outrage it's protest and it says one of the values core values of grief is it's the soul's refusal to live numb and small and to disappear when we're in grief. Grief is an act, like I say, is an act of protest. However, when we're not allowed to express our grief, that protest mutates into some other regressive form. You know, Carl Jung once said, whatever is pushed into the shadow doesn't just sit there. It regresses and becomes more primitive. Mm. So when we cannot express our outrage over what is happening to our world, to our ecosystems to our communities of color, when we can't protest that openly, that grief and that anger mutate into rage and violence. And it comes out what we saw on January 6th, you know, the capital invasion of the capital, very adolescent uh, ways of expressing what at core is a very human thing. When we feel unjust, and when there's injustice, when there's violation to the dignity of our bodies or our communities or our culture or our planet, the soul's response is protest, it's outrage. But if we, it's not given any mature way of expressing it, like ritual, then it will come out sideways in very aggressive forms. And that's what we're seeing a lot right now is very aggressive, uh, destructive forms of Protest. I wouldn't even call it protest. It's just, it's adolescent rage. Now, grief itself is one of the ways in which we mature as human beings. There is no such thing as a mature human who has not really sat with and learned to metabolize sorrow. That's a core ingredient to our maturation. And learning how to metabolize all of this, I often talk about it in terms of an apprenticeship of sorrow. You may have come across that term in my, in my work. The apprenticeship is, um, is a long process, just like all apprenticeships are. If you apprenticeship to a medicine person, it's a long process, right? It's, or a, a carpenter or a, uh, anybody. It's a long process. When we apprenticeship with sorrow, we know it's going to be decades long. And in the end of uh, a traditional apprenticeship, with a carpenter or a, or a weaver, you would be declared a master craftsperson. When you're working with soul and you're working with the apprenticeship with sorrow, it doesn't lead to mastery, it leads to elderhood. Mm -hmm. That's the long work of metabolizing grief, gravity. You're able to face whatever is moving through the streets, what's ever moving through the culture and you're able to metabolize that again and turn back towards those who are struggling with it, primarily our youth. And you become a, a, a place of steadiness because you carry gravitas, which is a, you know, someone who's learned how to work with that and has metabolized that. And now they carry a dignified bearing in the presence of it. God, wouldn't that be wonderful to see right now mm -hmm. in our in our deliberations around policy, you know, and how we're dealing with climate crisis and racial injustice. That's what we're needing right now. 
So we don't really have the space or the tools. We are kind of um, adult bodies walking around with little children or adolescents inside that haven't grown up. It's pretty spread, you know, in the collective from the leadership, uh, you know, political leadership, or maybe sometimes even some community leadership to, uh, you know, all of us. Um, so where do we start if I'm grieving today, if I'm in this process, what are, what are my tools here? Obviously, you know, you, you offer a beautiful uh, course, The Apprenticeship with Sorrow, which was the title of this talk to you, but what can I do really first when it comes to my own grief before we open it to kind of the collective and the support of others? The first move is basically one of befriending. How do I begin to establish an intimacy with my grief? We tend to have a, a very binary relationship. We either try to push it away or we drown in it. And what I'm talking about is how do I begin to establish a companionship? Recognize that basically every single day of your life, you will touch some presence that is connected to loss, to sorrow. You'll see roadkill, you'll hear news on the computer or on your phone about deaths, um, a species depletion, you'll, you'll hear news every day. And if we're naive, we try to either shut it off or distract. But if we're really taking up this apprenticeship, then I have to become skillful in maintaining an intimate relationship to this other, this presence of grief, to treat it like a companion. The second thing we need to do is cultivate some kind of practice in our life. Because we all know storms are coming. And the emotional storms, collective storms, uh, sometimes actual physical storms as the weather systems begin to become incredibly erratic. Uh, ironically, we have not had one single storm here this winter in California. It's frightening. But the practice is designed to give you ballast, you know, something to help steady you when the winds come. There's a wonderful image that came from uh, Kathleen Dean Moore, a wonderful writer. Uh, she wrote a book called, called Hold Fast. And the Hold Fast, if you go out to the coast of California, or imagine uh, the East Coast as well, there are kelp beds, at least there were kelp beds. They're disappearing rapidly. But the kelp at its base forms a chemical bond to the rock beneath it. So when the winds come of storms, you might get blown about quite a bit, but at base, you've got something holding you in place. That's what a practice does. It could be meditation or prayer or ritual or art, writing, dancing, doesn't matter. Just something to steady you. The third thing is self-compassion. When I wrote that book, The Wild Edge of Sorrow, I wrote that one of the values of grief work is that it opens the heart to compassion for other people's suffering. But I neglected to say in that book that to grieve my own grief, I have to cultivate the ground of self-compassion. I need to make my losses matter. Frequently, we dismiss our grief. We dismiss our losses. Well, they're not as bad as so-and-so. I'm not in you know, Afghanistan right now. I'm not, I'm not a refugee right now. So what do I have to grieve? Well, you have your losses. You have your own experiences of sorrow. And if we don't digest those, the heart will begin to congest and the heart will begin to harden. And then we won't be able to respond to anything. Mm. There's an old alchemical idea that you, you have to keep the material warm in the vessel so that it can continue to move and continue to change. When we don't bring self-compassion to our own sorrows, our own suffering, that material hardens and congeals, and there's no movement. So self-compassion is a gesture of warming. We bring kindness, mercy, gentleness, warmth, affection to these places of sorrow, and we allow them to cook, to move, to mature. I would say the next element in this apprenticeship is 
cultivating a relationship to silence and solitude. Even though much of our grief work is meant to take place in community, the reality is much of my time with it will be alone. So how do I take that alone time and change it from endurance, which is how we typically hold grief, how do I get through this, to changing it into really a sacred time? Silence and solitude are really sacred um, containment fields. Silence is a kind of hospitality to the quieter voices inside of us. And solitude is a sacred sanctuary where they get to be tended. I remember telling the story of a woman I was working with in my practice and she came in one day and she said, I really, I really hate going home alone at night. I said, she just went through a very difficult divorce. I said, why is that? She said, well, if I get home and the house is empty, it's cold, it's dark. And I just, all I, I just feel lonely when I walk in the door. And I said, well, can you imagine this as the holiest time of day? That when you walk in the door, you are meeting your most vulnerable self. And can you say to this part of you, I see you. Let's put the tea on. Let's warm some soup. Let's start the fire. Tell me about your day. I want to know all that you felt and all the stories that you're carrying about your sorrow. And then a line of Rilke, Raina Maria Rilke came to me. I am too alone in the world, but not alone enough to make every minute holy. That's such an exquisite move he makes. I am too alone in the world. We all know that feeling, right? We're too isolated, too cut off, too solitary. But then he makes this move, he makes this beautiful pivot, but not alone enough to make every moment holy. That's solitude, that's sanctuary, that's holy ground. From the last part of this apprenticeship um, is really to remember how entangled we are with the world. In our, in our fictions about individualism, we feel solid, we feel singular. We forget about our entanglement. A couple of months ago, before the election happened, I was going to bed one night full of, dis full of dread and despair. I was just so frightened that we might repeat the same election results as last time. And some part of me turned me around and I went to my bookshelf and pulled off this little volume by Linda Hogan, a Chickasaw elder writer, a collection called Dwellings. And there was a chapter in there. I opened the book up to this chapter called All My Relations. And I began to read it and I remembered, wait a minute, I'm connected to the moon and to the stars. And I'm connected to the Douglas fir and the redwoods outside and the sorrel and the owl and the raven and the wren. I'm connected to all of this. The oxygen I'm breathing is the blessing of the trees. I'm not alone. So in that moment, I remembered my entanglement. And because of that, I could sit with my grief again, my fear, my dread. I became larger than the field that I was experiencing. So all of that's about how do I begin the process of sitting with my own grief? That's a lot, but that's the apprenticeship in a nutshell. We could spend weeks talking about that. But. Yes, and I love this idea of kinship of uh, becoming a, coming into good relations, you know, with any parts, you know, not just our grief, but whatever is there. And um, an elder told me, it was a couple of years ago in South Dakota on a reservation, I asked him about what, what was their culture about? What was the key really that, if he could resume it very, very simply, what is this red road walking that way? And he, he sat for a second and he said, you have to be a good relative. It's just about being a good relative. And he said, and he added, he added, it's hard to be a good relative. Yeah. And I can see the parallel, you know, it's hard to, to sit, to be, to be kind when we're in pain, uh, to allow whatever is there to really come out. Or when we witness it in the collective, it's hard to be a good relative, you know, to stay in that, in that hard space. Yeah. 
Mm. So we have a lot of trauma in this country with the genocide of Native American people, with uh, the BIPOC movement, the race, and you know the George Floyds. I mean, this constant you know reminder um, of this pain that is present. And maybe as as white men, I mean, that's how I identify. You know, I carry some of that somehow, somewhere down my ancestry through epigenetics, through DNA. And you know, it came to me that maybe one of the reasons that prevents people to really access that is that it feels almost like a Pandora box. And that was a moment in my grief process where I felt like if I opened that, it was not going to be a wave of tears. It was going to be a tsunami. It was going to be just way too much for me to handle it. And I wonder if it's something you can maybe talk about, especially on the collective level, because there's so many things to address from environmental destruction than the other things I mentioned that how do we create this gentle space that is safe enough that we can start opening as communities, you know, as families even, or as little groups, so we can step by step becoming a good relative to what we carry in our communities as traumas and grief processes? It's a beautiful question. Um, and again, one of those questions that could take several decades to respond to. Let's go for it. <laughs> um, let's start with, um, there was something in your question that says that if I open that up, it would turn into a tsunami. And so I want to say, ironically, a word of praise to numbness. Uh, not that it's a great strategy, but when we're forced to face this material in isolation, uh, all by myself, the heart wisely closes down and says, I can't. So that's our first clue that we're in a territory that's too private, too alone is that the heart shuts down. What we need, even just to begin the, the process, is a, is a small enough circle of people where we can begin to tell the truths of our collective inheritance. We are all carrying trauma in our bodies. The good news is we're also carrying the inheritance of courage, of resilience. I mean, we're all here right now having this conversation because something happened in our ancestry that allowed us to survive. We're here. This is good news. Um, but we want to address the question of trauma. God, there's so many threads running through my mind right now. I'm trying to figure out which one to. Let's, let's talk about one thread about it is. Um, what I call at the heart of all our sorrows is a profound sense of emptiness as a white Western human being that has affected how I experience myself and how I how we have collectively experienced, I won't say culture, I will say society. We don't have a culture. We have a society. Uh, culture is an animate presence of entangled lives, ritual, song, food, a myth. That's a living thing. We don't have that in, in this country. We have a society which we have some governing rules, but we do not have practices that bond, bind, and sustain a people, much less a relationship to the wider uh, human, non, more than human world. Um, so we are the inheritors right now of this emptiness. And this emptiness comes from the rupture, from the severing of our living communities. We were talking just briefly before we got, came on air that you were, where you come from was invaded many times. And so there are traumas upon traumas of dislocation, of silencing of languages, of, you know, uh, 
the endings of ritual practices, the forgetting of stories. So many things have happened in our lineage that what we've inherited now is basically threadbare. Um, and so we look to other cultures, sometimes in a rapacious way, in a consumptive way, in a colonizing way, because we do not have something that sustains us day by day in our own knowing of who we are, where we belong, and what is sacred. We've forgotten how to answer those three fundamental questions. Who we are, where we belong, and what is sacred. And so we end up trying to colonize other traditions. Um, or we try to exterminate other traditions. And our work right now is to do the difficult work of facing that emptiness. I was at a racism workshop some years ago and we were going around the circle sharing our opening thoughts and just by the sheer design of it I was the last person to, to speak and when it was my turn I said well the thing that I'm working with the most is this question about emptiness and a black man jumped out of his chair and pointed at me and said that's it until your people deal with that you're going to continue to kill us and steal from us every day. And that hit me like a soul. Uh, um, command like that was my responsibility that I had to look at this issue. And it's the it's a hard issue to look at. No one wants to look at. It. We are the culture of abundance. Even our psychology is all about abundance. You can have it all. Well, no, we can't. There's no values of restraint in there or reciprocity or mutuality. It's all about the self. It's all about me. And why is it all about me? Because we, see, we feel so goddamn empty inside. Now, hopefully a lot of you listening to this don't feel that way. But for the majority of this culture, why are we the greatest consuming culture on this planet? Why do we make up, what, 5% of the population and 35% of the consumption? Why is that? because we feel on some level never satisfied. We can never get enough. Ask any addict, you know, we can never get enough. We need the newest phone, the newest car, the newest device. We are consuming our way out of life and breath on this planet. Mm. We never know enough is enough. And that's what I learned from my indigenous kin is how to live within the containment field of the environment, to not take too much, to be to practice the attitudes of gratitude, and to be very uh, conspicuous about our consumption. Uh, be very mindful of what it is we take. This emptiness is a huge gnawing beast that unless we deal with it, unless we look at it, we will continue to rely upon what I call secondary satisfactions. Pro uh, privilege, rank, power, supremacy over nature, over women, over people of color, over marginalized populations, we will continue to grab for that power to somehow mollify this feeling of hollowness inside of us. I had no idea where we were gonna go here today, but it feels absolutely right that we're talking about it. Um, so any thoughts about that from anybody, from you, Angel? Um, well, I feel like if I just, you know, I was listening to you, I was just feeling into my body. And if I feel into that, it can feel terrifying a little bit to really feel the scope of that and what it meant, what it means, how it act out and what's potentially there. And I was like, yeah, you see this protest and all of that and, and how oh, terrified maybe we are even more to go into feeling what's at the root of that. Yeah. Especially if there is not a support, if there is not a space for it that is safe enough. I mean, our world is definitely, this culture is definitely, or this society is definitely not safe. It's quite violent. You know, the economical system is violent and the health system is violent. I mean, it's pretty violent. So it's hard to find a place where, wow, if I were to feel that, can I just, like I wanted to, like I experienced at some point in my grief, completely collapse in it, completely surrender to it, 
knowing that something is going to hold me somehow because my practice told me that go there you'll be catch somewhere you know and we don't know when when but there will be that there hmm so unless you want do you want to add something on that francis or you know just that we do need spots spaces places in nature and also with a few other human beings um i, I talk about the to set grief down two things are required containment and release but mm -hmm. if i'm privately i can't do both jobs at the same time i can't both be a container and a releaser of grief so in some way i become a permanent containment field for grief and i never really get to the place of setting it down and then i become saturated in grief and people come into my office and say i feel depressed and I, I believe them, but when I listen to them, it's not so much depression as it is oppression. There are decades, generations, centuries of oppression of unmetabolized grief settling on top of their beings. And until we address that grief, they will not get current. They will not really be living their lives. They're going to be continuing to chew the bones of their history, their ancestry, and their you know, deep time ancestry. I want to get current. I want to actually have a taste of this life. You know, I want to feel the electricity of this life and be in the flow of this life. So that means doing this grief work because if that's part of what happens is we begin to feel more alive. And isn't that what we need right now? We, we need people feeling alive. And we need people willing to face and taste the sorrows of the world. Because if we don't, who will? I need to be able to feel the, the terrible rips and tears of a clear cut in the northern part of California. I have to be willing to feel that. I have to be willing to feel the suffering of my, my kindred brothers and sisters of people of color or marginalized cultures. I have to be willing to feel that because if I don't, I will again just be one who goes numb and stays small and stays silent. This is a critical, critical time. We're entering into what I call the long dark. It will, this is not going to end in a matter of years. The pandemic might be over, but we're just beginning to hit the first waves of climate catastrophe and economic instability. We're entering into a long dark. I'm not saying that to uh, intimidate or to depress anybody, but to prepare us. This is our apprenticeship right now. This is our initiatory time. We have to become uh, robust enough as adults to not collapse under the weight of what's being laid at our feet. We need to be able to be able to respond uh, openly and skillfully to what is coming towards us. So that in the generations to come, those seven generations, however long it's gonna take, that they might arrive in a place where their village has been remembered and that there are still salmon and the creeks. And there's still enough life on the planet to remember how beautiful it could be or that it is. That's what's our that's what's being asked of us now. Mm. Yeah, I deeply resonate with what you say. And that's in fact most of the feeling I had during the initial time of the pandemic. This was just a preparation, this was just an initiation into really having us looking how we're living here and, and preparing resilience, really looking at resilience and, and with our bodies and our lives and our communities. And yeah. So in that, you know, when you're speaking of that, I feel because we are really living in this Anthropocene that's so human centered and with technology and, and the advancement of science, we feel that first that we have control and when we don't have, we can find the solution. You know, we're going to find the way to fix that. And so we are very in that place of on top of the pyramid as little gods walking around. Um, and adding to that, I also feel that um, grief is walking in a very different way. What I mean by that is that it might be delayed. We're talking about grief from genocides, maybe that happened hundreds of years ago. Maybe that happened in our families. Maybe that happened, you know, a week ago. So 
when I approached my grief, there was a little bit of that uh, control things. I'm going to go about it. I'm going to find the key and I'm going to get out of it. And when I read, started reading your book, in fact, the first thing at the beginning that really hit me is like, oh, maybe I'm just going to learn to live with it. Maybe I'm going to be working with grief in a different relationship. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, we know the speed of light and the speed of sound, but the, the speed of grief and how grief kind of unfold and yeah, and how to approach that speed. When I was very young, 22 years old, no, 27, I think I was when I got licensed as a therapist. I was, you know, how did they give a license to a 27 year old? I don't know, but they did. <laughs> it wasn't my fault. Uh, but I was smart enough to know I didn't know anything about sitting with people. And so I apprenticed myself to uh, what I called the the Jung Institute in San Francisco and asked them for names of, of analysts in the area. And I called around and I talked to this one man, his name was Clark. And I said, that's the man I want to sit with. So I went over to his office the first time and he opened the door and my God, he was ancient. Oh my God, he was like 60. He was so old, you know, could barely believe he could walk. He said, oh my God, you know. And uh, we sat down face to face and he reached over and he patted this rock he had by his chair and he said, this is my clock. I operate at geologic speed. And if you're going to work with the soul, you need to learn this rhythm because this is how the soul moves. And he pointed to his clock and he said, it hates this. Now, I don't remember anything from graduate school. I really don't, but I'll never forget that teaching. That was the wisest thing anybody ever told me about how to sit with people, is how to slow us down to the speed of soul. His grief is one of the primary expressions of soul because it's an expression of affection, of love, tenderness, vulnerability. It, it brings us down. That is the territory of soul. Soul brings us down into the valleys, into the depths. And so that teaching about slowing down, we seem to be in a perennial hurry to get someplace. And in the fiction of Western society, it's always better. Progress. That's our dominant mythology is progress. Even in psychology, we always have to be making progress. Well, I've never seen that in almost 40 years of sitting with people. I've never seen a linear progression happen. It's always a meandering, a wandering, a getting lost, a getting stuck, a descent, a moving in all kinds of directions. That's how soul moves. And my job is to track soul, not to lead a, a parade, you know, to get from here to there, but to track soul. So when grief arrives, one of the first and most compassionate things we can do is attune ourselves to its rhythm. You know, when you're feeling grief, we slow down. We drop out of the mania of the collective. It's no longer about speed and accomplishment and productivity. It's about presence. And it's about dropping into some space that really requires deep witnessing. I often say that grief is not a, a problem to be solved, but it's a presence awaiting witnessing. So both in my own witnessing of it, but also then in asking for it to be witnessed by people who can just sit with me. And please no, don't give me any advice how to fix this, how to get over it, you know, or some platitude of, you know, it's, it'll, you know it'll be better. I don't, I don't need that. I just need you to sit with me and to bear witness to where I've been taken. You know, grief isn't a voluntary journey. We are taken into the territories of grief. We are pulled out of our ordinary world and taken into the depths. So I think the most important teaching here, slow down, enter geologic speed, begin to pay exquisite attention to the subtle movements of how sorrow is just coursing through your veins today. 
what language it wants to speak, what dance does it want to, to show, and, and be with it, be with it. Such a, such a wonderful um, way to support others in grief. And I have to say in my own process, there was very few people able to do that, but the people that did that for me, I felt very loved in that place. And I felt this gateway that was interesting at the bottom of it into greater love for self through that presence. You know, I realized that immense self-care I had to develop was really in fact the highest form of love that sitting that I could give myself in that moment. And when others offered me that, it was so nourishing with no words, no advice, no destination, no timing. So I really feel that. I really feel that here. Yeah, good. I mean, that's what's so beautiful about grief ritual is uh, when we begin the ritual process, we go as long as we need to go. It can be hours and hours that we're collectively weeping side by side, which is itself so profoundly healing because we typically cry alone. And just to have the privilege, uh, I often, you know, people arrive from Australia, from England, from Canada, they come from all over the world to, to do a grief ritual weekend with me. And I begin by saying, isn't it strange that we need a workshop on grief? Doesn't this speak to our incredible amnesia? That this is at the very heart of our grief is that we've forgotten how to do this in every community around the, around the planet. I got to spend some time in West Africa in my friend Maladoma's village and there were grief rituals happening almost every day. Mm. And they were the happiest people I've ever met. And there's, I remember walking up to one woman saying, you have so much joy. And her immediate response was, that's because I cry a lot. Oh my God, how un-American. <laughs> it's because I've got a lot of stuff in my closet, you know, I've got all the things I need. It's because I cry a lot. There was a direct relationship. I, I frequently refer to our culture as a flatline culture. That we have a very narrow band of what we're allowed to feel. We've closed off the lower register of grief and sorrow. And so consequently, the upper register of joy has collapsed. We don't know joy so much. We know excitement. We know stimulation, but we don't know joy that much. And so what I want to do by opening up that lower register is actually begin to feel my inheritance of joy, my delight, my ecstasy about this flesh, this body that can perceive so much beauty. But if I'm under that flat line, there's very little room to feel, much less express. What a gift it is to be in this body. So that gives me a, a beautiful segue in one of the last questions or themes, you know, that I wanted to talk about today. And I'm going to use a, a quote from your book, The White Edge of Sorrow, where you say, grief and love are sisters woven together from the beginning. Their kinship reminds us that there is no love that does not contain loss and no loss that is not a reminder of the love we carry for what we once held close. So loss, I mean, grief, sorry, and love, sisters. Can you talk a little bit about that? Let's do sisters. Well, you kind of said it there, is that uh, everything that, we, we, that comes into our heart is temporary. We get to hold on to nothing, either through our own disappearance, through our own dying, or through the disappearance of the other. Everything, everything, everything is a, is a kind of a, a temporary gift. And if we don't accept the rights of that, we will love partially. We won't fully yield to the demands of love if we don't accept also that we also have to accept loss alongside of it. I tell the story of a, of a man in his late 70s, early 80s, who was at a, a book reading I was doing in Southern California. 
and some people had talked to me before the before I shared that his wife had just died. And at some point, um, he was a an engineer from East Eastern Europe, and he raised his hand and he says, "I want to know the one, two, three of grief. How, how do I get over this?" And I said, "Well." I can't accept the premise of your question. It presupposes an ending to your grief. It will not end. This is your new relationship to your wife. You know, this is how she and you are in connection now. It is through this, I said, it will change over time. It will, it will become a bittersweet remembrance. But this is how you carry your love for her now. You have to be willing to feel this always. And then he started to cry and said, I can do that. You know, we don't have much faith in grief. We don't trust it, in part because of what, how little we've been taught about it, and how fearful we are of it, overtaking our lives and creating this life of misery and darkness forever. It's, that does not happen. If we work with grief, if we undertake the apprenticeship, grief ripens us, deepens us, opens us up to a fuller encounter with life. Uh, but loss and love, we cannot disentangle them. Everything we, I, I talk about the five gates of grief, and the first gate of grief is everything you love, you will lose. And that's a fierce teaching, it's a fierce truth. The Buddhists, Buddhists call it impermanence. But that's just the reality. And if I'm going to love fully, I have to already begin saying goodbye to everything that's come into me. And that's not a bad practice because it keeps the love very uh, precious and very alive, it keeps it current. We tend to take what we love for granted over time as if it's always going to be there but it's temporary, it's a loan, it's a gift. Treat it like such, say thank you to it every day. Be grateful for this presence. Part of my morning routine when I wake up is to say to myself, I am one day closer to my death. How will I live this day? How will I greet those I meet, like all of you? How will I bring soul into these interactions? I do not want to waste this day. In other words, I want to bring my warmth and my affection into every exchange. I feel miserably most of the time, but I try. You know, it's, 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 a good, it's a good attempt. It's a good, <laughs> good you know. Not saying I achieve it that often, but I try. So. No, I really love that because there's, I don't know, just maybe because of your experience with it, Francis, but also about the facts and the wisdom you shared but there's something that really trying to humble us here to bring us closer to god somehow to really put us on our knees and to slow down and feel our heart and connect to each other so that descent is really an invitation into our divine soul presence you know whatever we feel is there but somehow we resist it and we look in the other direction we are a very light-sided world, society. We like things rising. We like ascension. We like transcendence. That's spirit. It's lovely. It's beautiful. But we also need to become familiar with the terrain of descent. We have to, again, in our, in our binary systems, light is good, dark is bad. We need to become non-binary in so many ways right now. And in our, in our abandoning of the binary, we can begin to sense the holiness that dwells in the darkness. I mean, think about your heartbeat right now, happening in utter darkness. We hope it never sees the light of day. And think about everything that you ate yesterday or the day before came up out of the ground from the roots that dwell in the darkness. Rilke also had a phrase, he said, and yet, no matter how deeply I go down into myself, my God is dark. And like a webbing made of a hundred roots, 
a drink in the silence. So we must resacralize the darkness. So we're not so afraid of going down. Because right now we fight like hell to avoid that. We don't want to go down. We always want to be going up. Where the light is good, you know, where we can see everything, where we can control things. But the descent is one of abandoning control. It's more about humility, being shown things. We kind of feel our way, we braille our way through the darkness. And but we learn something so profound about our deep connection to all things in the dark. That's holy ground. We are, you know, in that descent as a collective, as a society, you know, we're in this great collapse everywhere we look, you know, with a little bit of heart and Attitude like the eagle view, we can see what's happening here. Uh, that dark night of the soul as a collective. So I want to to close here with with one question to you, as as we witness where we are today with this pandemic, with what's happening with the environment and the political system in general, not just in the U.S. It's quite happening pretty much everywhere at the moment. Um, which reminds me a lot of the uh, insanity during Rome's, you know, and the emperors that at just some point were really crazy and really lost completely track of their mission. But uh, what would be the, if you were in control of all <laughs> what's happening, it was this little god where you could, I don't know, manifest something for, for a community, for a country, for, for us. What would be that one thing you feel would really open that gate or you know show us that gate of grace show us that gate of reconciliation with our wounded part of self the one that are hurting and i want to cry what would be that great thing? So maybe there's two you know i can give you a few uh aladdin lamp wishes but if you had one uh what would be the thing that as we to move forward here because we can feel it can be very overwhelming and say well where do i start okay my grave but it's, it feels like really big what's happening I'm not expecting a solution, by the way. Can we answer with a riddle? Or <laughs> no, no, I, would, I would say that uh, I, would, I would try to instill courage and faith in people. Courage that this is a time that we have to, from the French, right? Courage, full heart. That we bring our full heartedness to this time. And that we have faith that there's something that we can draw from this time that we can, again, make medicine out of. I would let go of hope to a degree, because hope is oftentimes about not wanting to be where we are. This is where we are. And so I would ask that we cultivate the ground of courage and faith, and that we would become bold enough to imagine rituals of reconciliation, rituals of healing, rituals of grief, because I do feel it's the broken heart that might save our ass right now. It's the broken heart that remembers its entanglement with the world, mm -hmm. with, the, with the oceans and with the soil and with the sky and the moon and with our suffering brothers and sisters and others. It's the broken heart that remembers these things. It's not the insulated, self-protected heart, but to have the courage to have your heart break open and that's what I do have faith in right now, is because what I am seeing is that the denial is beginning to crack, the grief is beginning to pour, and this might be what, if there is a chance for reclamation and redemption, this is where it will begin, in the hall of the broken heart. Thank you that so i've tried to cover you know some of the theme and questions that people were asking uh here and i'm sorry we could not cover everything because i feel we would need weeks and months to to dive into that but um i want to remind you that you know you can go on francisware.net and check francis works i highly recommend his books especially the wide edge of sorrow and the other books that Francis has written. Uh, and Francis has a class, you know, uh, this apprenticeship with sorrow. And we might, 
you know, offer it to the community here at some point this year. So stay tuned for that. But I know you're for that, you know, on a regular basis and people can, can connect with you on that. Um, so thank you so much, Frances. I want to give you the last words. So thank you for coming and meeting our community and being here today. And the recordings will be available for everyone here um, and our website if you want to look back after that. And I just turn it towards you to, yeah, anything you want to share to, to close. And thank you so deeply uh, for holding that space today. Thank you so much for beautiful questions and your beautiful presence. And all of you that have taken this time to actually sit in the terrain of sorrow, that takes a lot of courage. And I wish we had more time together. To, I want, I'd love to hear from each of you. But I'll end by the way we end most of our grief rituals, which is a poem by Rumi, where he says, the tender words we shared with one another are stored in the secret heart of heaven. One day, like rain, they will fall and spread, and our mystery will grow green across the earth. May that be so. Thank you. Thank you. Much blessing, everyone. Thank you.